Good afternoon, my fellow engineers. Today we're going to be deriving the momentum continuity equations for the Navier-Stokes. And we're going to be doing this so that we can later on use them in the CFD uh, environment. So I'm just going to dive right in about what the momentum continuity equation is. Much like the mass continuity equation, which we derived uh, in a previous video, the momentum continuity basically says that momentum must always be conserved in any realistic application, especially when we're considering fluids, which, as we all know, will have momentum. So we're applying the law that momentum must always be conserved. When we say, right, a fluid is, is acting like it is now, this is its initial condition, it's going to do something, and we're going to predict that something by using three equations. The first is going to be the mass, mass continuity, which we've already got. The second is the momentum continuity, and the third will be the energy continuity. And between these three equations, we'll be able to predict what the fluid is going to do after a certain amount of time. Now, I must say, you can look at the momentum continuity, or uh, indeed the mass and energy, in different environments. The environment that we're going to look at is the Cartesian form. Okay. I'm just going to dive right in there and, uh, and start working with it. So, this here is our fluid, the fixed volume. It's just going to be um, an arbitrary, but a very small amount of the fluid. We're going to be working with the Cartesian coordinates. And the fluid is going to have these dimensions. So it's going to be dx meters, I guess, wide, dz meters deep into the page, and then dy meters tall. What we've said is, in order to start deriving the equations, the momentum continuity equation, we've said that the momentum must always be conserved. What I mean by that is, the rate of change of momentum, or, or rather, the amount that the uh, momentum is going to be changing, the total momentum is going to be changing, is going to be equal to the rate of momentum coming into the fluid in one way or another. This will just be um, the amount of fluid that's coming into this uh, volume minus the amount of momentum that's coming out of the fluid, out of this volume, plus some surface forces which will act upon the fluid, plus body forces which will also act on the fluid as a whole. Now surface forces will be things like pressure um, and stress and body forces will be things like gravity. So gravity can obviously act on the fluid. We could also have uh, a fluid that's influenced by an electric or magnetic field as well. Let's look at the left hand side first. So we're saying that's the total rate of momentum or there's the total change in momentum. Well, it's going to be the mass of the fluid multiplied by the velocity of the fluid going in. So it's basically the uh, mass of the fluid multiplied by its acceleration. That's what the change of momentum is. It's effectively a force. So we've got the density of the fluid multiplied by its volume. Now its volume V is, because it's a cube, dy dx dz, multiplied by, as I said, the acceleration or the rate of change of the velocity. So if we just really quickly say that in the x direction, we're gonna have u, in the z direction, we're gonna have velocities of w, in the y direction we'll have velocities of v. We'll come on to those in a little bit more detail in a second. But So the total rate of change of momentum is going to be equal to the mass of the fluid multiplied by the acceleration of the fluid, or how the fluid uh, acceleration, uh, the, how the fluid velocity changes over time, which is what acceleration is. Now we're going to look at these parts here. So we've done that, we're going to look at these parts. So if we define m in minus m out all at once, that's going to be equal to the flow rate of the fluid coming in multiplied by the spatial change of the velocity. So what I mean by this is for the x direction, we're going to have the flow coming in, which is going to be equal to u, multiplied by dy dz. That's the rate of flow coming in multiplied sorry, by Row. That's the rate of flow coming in multiplied by the velocity at x, which will be the velocity coming in here, minus because that's the m in part, so just that just that would be the m in part. The m out part would be u x plus dx. Like that. So that's just for the x direction. We're also going to have one for its y component through the x direction.
y direction we've got the velocity coming in i'll just call this vol so that you don't get confused um that'll actually be the velocity coming in in the y direction multiplied by the area which it's facing so d uh, dx dz the velocity coming in the y direction multiplied by again multiplied by the same for the z direction so coming in the z direction which is in this direction is going to be multiplied by dy dx multiplied by the density of course multiplied by again ux minus next is our surface forces uh, three components of surface forces first of all we're going to have generic pressure on both sides so on the left hand side we're going to have a pr uh, hydrostatic pressure of px applied to the face dy dz and then on the other side we're going to have a pressure at x plus dx we're also going to have shear forces now if we consider if we consider this fluid right we're considering the flow in that direction which means that as flow goes around this fluid imagine it's just like a it's a cardboard box in the middle of the fluid as the external fluid travels around it it's going to rub up against the side it's going to create this shear force this shear pressure now the shear pressure which we'll denote with t is going to be acting on the z directional face because remember z is in that direction the z directional face in the x direction so we're going to say the z directional face in the x direction so if we're looking at this the front and back face would be in the z directional face that's the face that's normal to the axes uh, if you're looking in the x direction it would be that face and that face because they're normal to the x-axis and then the y face would be the top and the bottom face so we're going to have yx multiplied by now y again is in the y face it's going to be dx dz T Y X DX. We're also going to have that for and we're also going to finally have a shear force or a normal force acting on the actual faces, which will denote T X X, because it's on the X face in the X direction. And it's going to be colliding with these faces, the side faces, which will be Z Y. finally our body forces will simply equal the mass of the fluid multiplied by the acceleration at which is being applied i.e. gravity or the magnitude of the uh, electromagnetic force or whatever's being applied to it so it can be the mass of the object which will be the density multiplied by its volume dx dy dz multiplied by whatever the um, acceleration is in that direction which will then note as gx so what I'm going to do I'm going to bring all this just over here to make it uh, very difficult to read. In fact, one thing that I'm going to do actually, because what we can see, you might be able, you might have spotted that this these delta x's, delta y's, delta z's pop up quite a lot. So what we're going to do in one lovely sweep, we're going to try and divide all of these by dx, dy, dz. So we're going to try and divide all of these by that, which would mean if I write this out again. we should get right the mt will be rho multiplied by du dt the mn minus m out the uh, momentum rate the change of momentum as you fly in minus the change of momentum as you fly out will be equal to all over so we've divided by dx dy dz we had that was a dy and a dz so we've got dx plus the same for these as well plus the surface forces which will be
plus finally our body forces, which is just going to be density by gx. So now we're going to make a very important leap. We're going to say that if we consider, for example, ui minus ui plus delta i all over delta i, that is effectively the difference in ui over, and because delta i is very small, again, we're considering a very, very, very small volume here. This isn't the whole fluid. This is a tiny, tiny volume in the fluid. Okay, so if di is approaching zero, then we can effectively just make it di on that, okay, which we can actually convert to dui di. So as a result, things like this ux minus the well, basically the the difference in the velocity over the difference in distance can be the velocity change with respect to distance. So we can start to simplify all of these things very very easily. multiplied by the difference in the velocity in the x direction over the difference in x, same for v, same for z, same for the pressure, same for tau y x, that is the Navier-Stokes momentum equation. Yay! That's actually the fine way of putting it. This is in x direction. That is a perfectly adequate way of putting it. What we are going to do in just a second, actually we're going to uh, simplify this so it's a lot easier to understand. We can get rid of some terms as well. So I'm going to do that over on the next page. So one thing that we can say is these shear forces, these shear forces with, with the uh, donation uh, tau, these can actually be written in terms of velocities. So we can actually say that Tij would actually equal, the that's the viscosity of the fluid, that's not uh, the velocity in the x direction, it's viscosity. So the viscosity of the fluid multiplied by... So what we're saying is that the shear force fluid, the shear, the shear force in the fluid is equal to the viscosity of the fluid, which is just a value, multiplied by how the velocity in the i direction changes with respect to the j direction plus how the velocity of the j direction changes with respect to the i direction. So it will mean actually that something like tyx can actually be written as the other thing that you've got to bear in mind is if we consider something like txx that would look like du in the uh, x direction plus, again, du in the x direction, which simply equals 2 by the viscosity. So why have I bothered doing that? Over here we've got delta tyx with respect to the y direction. So if we say something like tyx dy, that's saying derive, derive that with respect to y. And that becomes, because the viscosity doesn't change, that can come outside the front. That's supposed to be a dx dy if you can't see that bit. Similarly, and then finally. Well, why have I done this? Well, we've said that we've got this little bit here. So if we just extract that for a second. What is this actually equal to? Well, we've got the viscosity is the same, so we can take that out to the front of, of the bracket. So the last little thing that we're going to do for this little bit 
is we're going to start to pull these together in a nicer way. So what I mean by that is, well, first of all, let's just say that that does actually equal. So let's look at these terms. What you'll notice is that a lot of these involve a dx. This involves one dx, this involves a dx, and one of these will involve a dx. In fact, they both do, but we're only going to consider the one of them. So we're going to say that this stuff up here is actually going to be equal to And if we look at this little section, if you remember back to the mass continuity equation, we've said that this, by definition, must equal zero. I'll point you in the right direction of that if that's difficult to understand. But it basically means that we can cross out that. So what benefit has that actually brought us? Well, it means that these three terms can now actually be expressed in these three terms. So if we write this equation... So the benefit of that was ignore all the variables that are a constant. So we'll just say that density is constant, uh, gx is a known value, the viscosity is constant. Everything else that we care, oh, and the pressure we know because the pressure is a constant for a second. Okay. Let's just assume, or let's just say rather, that rather than having to deal with shear forces, which we can't easily predict, we're instead going to put everything in terms of just the velocities and the distances and the times. We've turned it from a complex uh, geometric and force equation into just a geometric equation. And this can only be done, obviously, when we say that the continuity, the mass continuity holds up, which we can for any given situation. So this is a very common form of the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah. That's all come from this idea, that upon this point, down here, we've got a velocity going in the x direction, a velocity going in the y direction, and a velocity going into the z direction, which we're actually going to say that that's u, that's v, and that's omega. And then also we've got forces on each face, and then the entire thing could be subject to gravity or uh, uh, electromagnetic force. And then we've also got this hydrostatic pressure as a result of it just simply being a fluid.